In this video, I'm going to tell you about how I come up with the paint schemes that I use on my miniatures. I want to lead off by basically saying that this is how I do it. You may do it differently. That's cool. If you think that it's a, um, maybe a unique idea or an idea that's a lot smarter than mine or something like that, put it in the comments below. And if you're stuck on how to come up with um, different types of you know, schemes, paint schemes, color schemes for your miniatures, and if what I say up here is dumb, then go look down there in the comments. Generally, when I'm starting to paint some sort of new miniature or a group of new miniatures, whether they are, um, you know, let's say they're all part of the same outfit, the uh, same military thing, same whatever, same space force, you know, whatever, and they have to have matching, you know, ensembles or, or armor or, or, or uniforms, whatever you want to call it. Um, very frequently, the first thing that I come up with is, am I going to base this off of the lore? Am I going to base this off of the box art? Am I going to base this off of what this company has already put forward for me to base it off of? Or am I going to do something different? So if you decide I'm going to do what it says on the box or what I see on the website or what I see in the books, there's nothing wrong with that. Wanting to make your ultramarines ultramarine is is fine. You can change colors, you know. You can technically paint uh, blood angels yellow. Technically, they're lamenters, but it's a you know fine line. But you can do what you want. That's what's cool about this hobby. But if you what you want to do is to basically follow the the steps so that your models specifically look like the box art colors or maybe something in the book or just the lore, you know, you can do that. You can tweak as well if you want to. You don't have to stress out about getting the exact perfect shade of green or something like that. In historical miniatures, you do see people get real fussy about specific colors. But if you're painting fantasy or sci-fi, go nuts, you know. As long as it makes you happy, do what you want. But if you are thinking about going with the artwork, the lore, the whatever that the company that makes this game puts out, then that's where you start. You look at it and you go, okay, cool. You know, they use red, but the black on the shoulder pad edges and stuff, and then the pouches are blue or brown or green or whatever they are. And then you can tweak from there if you want to as well. But there's nothing wrong with starting with and just working directly off of what you see on the box or on the website or in the magazine. But maybe you don't want to follow the rules, you know, you're a rebel. Uh, instead, you want to do what you want to do. Or maybe particularly there are no rules, you know. There's plenty of companies out there that make miniatures that don't have an affiliated, you know, game with them. So there's not any lore to say that these guys are supposed to be dressed in electric blue or anything along those lines. They may put something on the website, they may have a pro painted version on the website, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the way it needs to go. So then you kind of need to come up with your own stuff. So how do you do that? Well, I always start by looking at the miniature, which seems obvious when you say it, true. But the thing that you look at on the miniature is the materials. And I don't mean the plastic or the metal or the resin that make up the miniature. I'm talking about what the sculptor was trying to put on this miniature when they sculpted the miniature. Is this supposed to be leather? Is this supposed to be metal? Is that skin? Is that, is that fur? What, you know, is this bone? Looking at all the different parts of the miniature and figuring out, like, is he wearing gloves or do he just have really big hands? That kind of stuff is sort of important. And sometimes, you know, with certain model lines, you can kind of choose. You could say, well, those are either just really big, meaty, you know, mitts or uh, actually wearing, you know, uh, mittens. Uh, or, uh, but so you can make that choice and then you can paint the way that you want to. I always go through and look and go, okay, well, this is obviously bone and this is fur. Well, what color could the fur be? Eh, you know, fur can be a lot of different colors. Bone has a tendency to be a single color or a specific set of colors. Metals have a tendency to be metallic. Now, this doesn't mean that if you want to make your sword bright purple, completely matte finish, completely bright purple so that it looks like it's plastic or something like that, you can totally do that. Again, there are no hard and fast rules. You get to do what you want. But if you're looking at it going, I want other people who see this miniature to understand that's metal, well, then you have a specific set of paints that you kind of have to sit within to make that effect go, you know, go out to the people who are looking at it. So what you do is sit down, look at the miniature, and say, okay, this is skin, this is maybe tights. Like, there's times when you can't tell necessarily, you know, in the sculpt. And sometimes 
With newer sculpts, it's generally a lot more clear because there being more computer done, and so things are a lot sharper, fancy smancy plastics and stuff like that. But when you're looking at old miniatures, especially old miniatures that were sculpted by hand with green stuff and then poured into metal, sometimes it's real hard to tell what the heck this part is. You know what I mean? Is that more pouch? Does he have a goiter? Like, what's going on there? Should I paint it leather? Is that skin? I don't know. So go through and look at all the stuff on the model and figure out what's what, because that can help you. Sometimes you're like, okay, well, he's got this huge horn, right? And so because of that color, now I kind of have to think about what colors are going to be accentuate that, you know, because this is sort of a set color, at least in my mind, that kind of thing. Figure out the materials. And again, cloth can be whatever color you want. Leather can be specifically kind of whatever color you want, that kind of stuff. But figure it out so that you at least have a good sort of um, parameter set to start working and picking colors in. Then there's mood. Honestly, um, you know, as you get more into painting, you'll find that there are times that you not only just want to paint the model to be the right colors or to be whatever you perceive to be the right colors, you also want to maybe give a mood or an emotion across. You may go with very, very muted colors because this is supposed to be kind of a bit of a lifeless kind of a creature, some sort of shambling horror or something like that. Or maybe you're painting clown warriors and so therefore they need to be pretty bright, you know, that kind of thing. You've got a lot of different options that way, but mood can really help to set off you know, your color selections. Sometimes your base colors are still your base colors, but then what you put over the top of everything can then convey mood. I like to sometimes use enamel washes. I like to use enamel washes, airbrush them on, and then let them sit for about three, four minutes, and then start wiping it away with an old t-shirt. And then everything has got this sort of brown dinge to it, which gives it definitely a specific mood. It doesn't necessarily mean they're dirty. It may, depending on how thick you leave it on there. But sometimes it just colors everything and just gives it a specific mood. And that's something to think about as well. Another thing is the state of the model. And I don't mean in Idaho or whatever. I mean, I mean, is it parade ready? Is everything all polished and clean? Or has it been out slogging out in the mud fighting in a war for the last three weeks and it hasn't had a lot of time for showering? You know, that kind of thing. I have a tendency to prefer to paint my miniatures grungy and dirty. Two reasons. Number one is because I think that war, you know, warriors would would be dirty and grungy. Um, and secondly, it's because the, the more washes I can put on, the more sins that I can hide in the goof ups that I might do in my paint job. So you might want to consider that as well, especially if you're starting out. But if you're painting an elfin princess who is floating above the glade, she probably shouldn't be real dirty or grungy. She shouldn't be covered with splattered blood. She should probably be very scrubbed, clean and fresh, bright colors, that kind of thing. So the state of the model is really also an important thing. The mood and the state to figure out what kind of overall treatments you may do to the colors that you finally decide. But also it can also help to figure out what initial base colors you're going to go with. This is a question that I get a lot. And I talked about it a number of years ago. Pachow. Do you need to know color theory? In my opinion, no. But it's probably not a bad idea to at least get the barest minimum of ideas of what color theory is. In real quick terms, color theory is the color wheel, and it talks about like what colors work with each other. I'm not talking about matching, like you're trying to put together your, your fancy outfit. I'm talking about like this color causes this color to pop more or to resonate more or to just visually stand out more. Whereas this color can skew that color. And, you know, knowing these things about the complementary colors and stuff like that is important. Now, I would say that you don't necessarily want to completely let it inform your entire uh, belief system in picking your colors. Some people will say, well, if I'm going to have a lot of warm colors, I also have to have some cool colors so that there's balance. I don't know that there always has to be balance. You know, if you've got like a fish person who's just come out of the cold sea, painting them all predominantly in cooler colors, I don't think anyone's going to go, well, that's weird. Look how cool the colors are on that fish person who's mostly frozen solid coming out of the cold, cold sea. It doesn't make any sense. I'm currently working on the skeletons from the cursed city uh, Warhammer Quest box set, and I'm going to be working in predominantly all warm colors on them. I just started recently on Twitch with them, and I've not gotten super far, but I'll be painting again on Friday at 10 a.m. Central, and uh, then also Monday nights at 7 p.m. Central. Uh, but I'm going with all warm colors. I don't want to have... I kicked around the idea of their kind of flowing cloth skirts, for lack of a better term. 
thought about going with like a cool color, like a blue or something like that. But I really thought I want to go with a faded, faded kind of red. And then I want to go with metallic for obviously the metal parts. But I want it to be also brown and dingy and almost a bit corroded. And then, of course, the bone is going to, well, be bone color. Um, so all of those colors are going to be within the warm spectrum. And I think that that's an interesting kind of thing to learn. Now, if I really wanted something to just pop and be crazy, like if I want their eyes to glow, I would probably go with a cool color because all of that warm would make that cool color pop a lot more. The warm color is just for those of us who are keeping track at home. Your reds, your oranges, your yellows, and the cool colors are the greens, the blues, and the purples. Think about water and ice and think about, you know, fire and you pretty much got it nailed down. So what if it's just not really clear? You can't just see it. Some people can just look at something and get the idea in their head and then go, yep, I know what I want to do. I have a tendency to do that, but I've been not only an art nerd for, well, since middle school, but I've also been painting miniatures for a good long time too. And so I can just look at things sometimes and go, I think this is going to work. And I do pick up colors on the fly very frequently, specifically when working on single characters. But that being said, you may want to test things out ahead of time. And I've done it as well. I did a video about actually using a computer to test things out. But ciao. Basically, you take a picture of your unpainted model, you turn it black and white. I mean, generally the model's kind of black and white already because it's generally gray. But anyway, you, you turn it black and white and you throw it into your computer and there's different software that's browser-based so you don't have to own Photoshop or anything fancy like that. I mentioned that in the video. And then you can go through and say, I want to put blue here and orange here and see what that looks like. And their helmet's going to be this color and all that kind of stuff and be like, hmm. And then that can help you at least get further down the road if you're having a hard time visualizing it. Figuring that out and hopefully taking some of the stress off you so that you're like, gosh, I just don't know if this is the right color. Should the boots be red? Well, try it on the screen and see. Once you think you've got it figured out, then the trick is to actually start painting it. Start putting it down onto the model. And there's a couple of things I want you to understand. Number one, if you're not really sure yet about painting, you're watching this video as a, as a newer painter, then I did a video about how to get started and beginner stuff for painting. But ciao, check that out, and that can help you take the colors that you've picked out and now put them onto the actual model. The other thing you need to understand is if you go through and you're looking at this model, maybe it's a single model, like you're painting a D&D &D character, or maybe you're painting a small, you know, squad of soldiers, and you're starting on the first one, you paint the, the boots brown, and you just sit back and look at it, and you're just like, I, oh, that's just terrible. I shouldn't have done that. I, I, I can't. I, there's nothing I can do. You can just paint black over the top if you wanted to go instead of black. Or you could... Let's say use a khaki color and then lighten it up. Maybe their boots are white. I don't know. Maybe it's after Memorial Day, but before Labor Day. Whatever. You can paint over even single parts. You can either just throw down like a nice gray to kind of like undercoat it if it was too dark or if it was too light. You can. There's a lot of things you can do to undercoat. I wouldn't just try to take a color and put another color directly over it. You sometimes want to put a mid color in between to help that second color cover a little bit better. But you can easily do that. Um, if you've gotten to a point where all of a sudden you find that your last four or five choices in color on this particular model are not to your liking, you thought they were, but they, they aren't anymore. And understand that there's no right or wrong. If you like the way it looks, that's all that's important. That's the most important part. There's no like, oh yeah, no, you shouldn't use that color because it doesn't go with that color. That person may say that to you, but that's their opinion to some degree. I mean, to a big degree, it's their opinion. There are scientific things you can say about, again, you know, complementary colors, the color wheel, all that junk. But if you look at it and go, this is what I want, then don't listen to other people. But if you've looked at this model for a while and you're saying to yourself, this is not what I want, you can always strip the model and start over. There's never ruined pretty much ever in models, in, in painting miniatures. You can always throw it into some sort of fluid and uh, strip that paint and uh, start over again.